Okay, so this afternoon I promised you a meditation on the topic of guru devotion, the guru. That's what we're looking at. The, and I thought it would be nice to focus on the kindness of our teachers. I do think it's really healthy that we feel that we can openly discuss our experiences, perhaps of difficult situations that have emerged in um, with some teachers, but also to recognize that really we wouldn't be here without the teachers. The teachers are everything, and in this way, we see them as manifestations of the Buddhas because we wouldn't have the Dharma, we wouldn't have the oral transmission, we wouldn't know how to practice, we'd know nothing really without contact with these incredibly kind teachers. So let's just spend a few minutes stabilizing our minds, finding our posture, taking some nice breaths, letting everything go, the wild weather, the morning's teachings, just let it all go and find spaciousness, that lovely, calm feeling. Equanimous, compassionate, and wise, getting in touch with our Buddha nature. We just think of our motivation for doing this meditation on considering the value and the preciousness of the teachers and gurus we come into contact with. And that may be literally meeting the physical emanation of a guru, teacher, or it may be through knowing about them. Like His Holiness, the Dalai Lama, or maybe even Lama Yeshi, who you've never met but heard so much about. And make your motivation.
So one of the assertions in Buddhism is that the spiritual guide, the spiritual teacher is kinder than all the Buddhas. I'm just going to give you a little time to consider that and how that might be true before I make some suggestions which are in the teachings. So traditionally, our contact with the Dharma would have come through the physical presence of a teacher. Nowadays, we might pick up a book, which most likely has been written by a spiritual teacher. Or we might watch them on something like YouTube. So we see them as a video emanation. So let's keep that idea of manifestations and emanations. The kindness of the Buddha coming through the teachers, that's who we meet. We don't meet the Buddha. And in order to be our teachers, they have gone through a great deal of hardship. Simple living conditions. Hedonistic pursuits are out. as is the accumulation of material wealth and comfort. We have rigorous hours of study. They live with hardly any possessions, just enough to survive and to learn. Lama Yeshi and Lama Zopa fled Tibet and were put in the Indian camp of Baksa, where great scholars were, Gishi Rabtan included, so many great scholars. They suffered terrible living conditions. The heat was oppressive. They didn't know about diet, so ate the wrong kind of food. 
their space was cramped and difficult to clean. And they had to live under regulations. They'd lost their homeland. And yet they continued to study and meditate. And when they weren't studying and meditating, they recited prayers and texts. And even later, we can see that from Geshe Sherab, Geshe Zopa, that they go through the equivalent of about 20 years of training to get their Geshe degree, as we might call it, to be qualified to teach us. And that's why they're doing it. And there is no certainty of being paid or housed. They have incredible faith and trust. And somehow, through excellent karma, we met them. So from your heart, just generate incredible gratitude and joy that you have met these precious teachers who are vast stores of knowledge, wisdom, and compassion. And the whole life is dedicated to transmitting the Dharma. The whole life. Or to being on retreat to increase their own realizations for our benefit, having taken the Bodhisattva vow to become enlightened, to benefit all sentient beings. So that is how the spiritual teacher is kinder than the Buddha. They are kind in teaching us the Dharma as lineage holders with the oral transmission. Because we can trust that it is the truth, the Dharma. It's not just their ego-based ideas of the Dharma. They are loyal to the transmission of the Dharma. So it's pure. So they are kind and putting their ego to one side, subduing any non-virtuous attempts to entertain
or to show how brilliant they are. They just transmit the pure Dharma in an egoless way, in a way that will benefit us most. How kind, how incredible, so rare. And the teachings say that all realizations come from receiving the Guru's blessing, which literally translates to transforming into magnificence, awakening our Buddha nature. So when we listen, to the teachings about the Guru teaching us and how as a disciple or heart disciple or following one's Guru, we then receive realizations more quickly through having that blessing. There is a connection the Guru's mind with the disciple's mind. Psychic connection. And that's how we become enlightened more quickly. So not only are they traveling the world to meet us and to teach us the Holy Dharma in all its purity. They are just waiting for our minds to open, our hearts to open, so that they can psychically bless us. How incredible. the rarest of human attributes. Not our mother or our father in all their unconditional love could do anything like this. In that way, they are kinder than our mother and father. Then think of the kindness of when you want advice. So not only do they teach, but they will see you personally. It is rare to come out of a meeting with your guru without having received some kind of gift. They give robes, they give chocolate, whatever they have, whatever will make the connection and please you and help you. They give money, they will do.
and they will keep you close because you are family, you are spiritual family. You're so kind. And it is said that when you receive your guru as Buddha, as having no delusions, then you are seeing Buddha. You may be walking in the street with your teacher and other people just think they're a nice person. But you are receiving the kindness of a Buddha. So rare, so precious, so much to rejoice about for us now so you can make your own personal prayers in this uh, these sessions on refuge about you as a student your wish to be a heart disciple Rejoicing over who you know just in your own personal way. Just feel incredibly blessed. Very gently, in your own time, bring your meditation to an end. Okay, let's um, move on. Mm. Does this sound all right? Let me check. Great, that's good. Lovely, thank you. Okay, now this is interesting. <laughs> 
we've already talked about how the Buddha might manifest as our spiritual teachers, yeah, because uh, that is the way in which we make contact with the Dharma. So um, it's natural to wonder, well, when you become a Buddha, what then? <laughs> Where do you go? What do you do? You know, is it like Christian idea of heaven or whatever you've heard? How does it work? So this is an opportunity for us to consider the Buddhist explanations, which are pretty spacey. Yeah, they really are quite unusual, but it, it kind of makes sense because, first of all, we need to re we need to remember that we are energy beings. Yeah, primarily that's what we are, and we. We cycle around samsara, taking form bodies, quite sort of material, solid, messy, mucky, contaminated aggregates, whatever realm that we're in, in samsara, in some way. So when we depart samsara, which we will do one day, we are liber liberated, we attain nirvana, and then when we continue on with that consciousness energy to complete the full path of compassion and attain bodhicitta and become fully enlightened, then it makes sense, doesn't it, that we're going to be pure energy beings. We're not going to have contaminated aggregates. So let's start there. That, that just makes, well, it makes sense to me that and it's not that we will, in our spirit form, as we are now, you know, kind of depart and find some heavenly realm. And that seems to be as far as the imagine, imagination goes when you watch kind of movies, you know, is, is that somehow we stay as we are and, and then we kind of go to some heavenly realm, whatever that is, you know. I did this with my students at school once, you know, where, where do you think you go? Because I was a religious studies teacher and um, I had some great ideas. One of them was, uh, well, you get to play football forever. <laughs> now, I couldn't imagine anything worse. But, <laughs> but in that child's mind, that was heaven, you know, or, or, you, or you get to just play and be with your mum and dad and, everybody like that, you know, forever. And, and then we unpacked it, of course, and uh, saw some of the issues with that, that it didn't quite make sense. But there's definitely a sense when you talk to most human beings that somehow we go to a place which is better than this, yeah? A heavenly realm, yeah? So just bear that in mind when we're uh, talking about Buddha nature and the bodies of a Buddha and what that is suggesting. So we know that outside of um, samsaric realms, all the different realms, the, you know, the hell, the hungry ghosts, the gods, the, the humans, all, all those realms, there are other realms of existence. So it's not to say that nothing exists. There are form realms and there are formless realms. And we can take rebirth in any of these for any number of eons, yeah? So we can be stuck in these kind of realms, just perhaps um, residing in a kind of um, contented way, but not really going any further. So there's many different ways our consciousness can move on when it leaves this body. So when, when a being becomes Buddha, they, their, their basic manifestation is first of all what is natural in terms of consciousness and then in terms of how they can help beings. And the very many different beings are, you know, even high bodhisattvas, they will manifest to help as well as ourselves and any other being. So basically we're looking at an at energy that is purified, awakened, and can manifest as anything that benefits beings. Yeah? So if, 
if you have made the vow, uh, you know, you will become fully enlightened uh, in order to benefit all beings, then you've got to manifest. You've got to somehow make a connection um, with the beings that need help. So this is an explanation. And um, this is basically our understanding. And it's not easy to understand. It's not easy for me to understand. So if anybody's got any clarification at any point, then please do. But let's go with it. Basically, um, what we're talking about are what are known as um, Sanskrit, the kayas, the, the bodies. So we know them as something kaya, yeah, something body. Okay, so that's how they're discussed. Normally, we look at the three obvious kayas, the three kayas, which are Dharmakaya, Sambhogakaya, and Nimanakaya. But there is a fourth one, which I've tucked in here just as a challenge to myself, really. <laughs> because again they're really not easy to explain but you will come across them so okay so buddha nature yeah buddha nature bodhicitta must be generated from our true mind which is our buddha nature our true mind is buddha nature okay so this is pure. It's not, it doesn't come out of our uncontaminated body of flesh and bones, nor from our self cherishing, deluded mind. These are all unstable and impermanent. These, this body, the, these bodies emerge from our pure Buddha nature, yeah? which is manifest when we are enlightened. Okay, so our genuine body, this is our genuine body we're talking about now, our bodies, our genuine energy body is perfect and complete, empty and quiescent. Yeah, that's how it's described. Perfect, complete, empty of inherent existence and quiescent. Okay, our genuine mind, our Buddha nature is vast in scope and imbued with intelligence and awareness. So we have cognition, we know objects, intelligence, sensitivity, and awareness. The perfect and complete Dharma body is full of virtuous qualities. Okay. It's empty and quiescent in that it goes beyond all forms and characteristics and is free of disturbances. So, you know, it's good to get our heads around this because, to be honest, it's unimaginable. Yeah? What we are, what our pure Buddha nature is, it's unimaginable. It's, it's very hard for us to. Consider. So the genuine mind coincides with the Dharma Datu, the sphere of reality, the Dharma realm. So we're not, our genuine mind is not existing in samsara. It's in the, the, the genuine sphere of reality, which is called the Dharma Datu. Okay. Focused, clear, investigative, illumination. That's Buddha nature. So we're talking about something that is inside us that we are cleaning through our process and eventually that will emerge. Now that's pretty spacey for a start because we don't relate to ourselves like that. Generally, we do not think of ourselves as being other than pretty confused messed up with this physical body, all its ailments, all its aging, all the rest of it. And that's what we see. That's what we see. So that's what we relate to. So when we visualize all these incredible beings of pure light, 
whether they be green as Tara or white or golden as we tend to see the Buddha or blue as the medicine Buddha, when we see all these beings in our imagination, we think it's them. We just always think that is not, that is, oh, that's lovely out there. That being is lovely out there. Even when we're visualizing, it's very hard for us to, to imagine that actually that is our quality we are reflecting. We are reflecting. And when we do visualize, we're making a connection with our quality that one day we will manifest in the Dharma Dhatu, the sphere of genuine reality. So that's good to get regularly in, in contact with, you know, it's, it's good to visualize and, and it's always good to try and remove. I think it's more natural to, if you've been brought up to Tibetan Buddhists, you know, but when you come into it after our kind of different conditioning, whatever religion or secular place we've had and the way we inhabit the world, it, it's, although we kind of know, we get it, we're talking about outer and inner. We've been talking about that in, in uh, the teachings on refuge, but we still kind of feel that this, you know, the bodies of a Buddha is something that's nothing to do with us. And it is totally to do with us because this is there. And when you manifest that clear Buddha nature, this will be you. This will be you. That's incredible. It, it's not a dream. It's not a hope. It's not a prayer. It's a reality because we will all become enlightened at some point in some future. So what are we going to be? <laughs> so here we have. Um, OK, make, make, let me make sure I get some of these right. Yes, this is a nice little quotation, which I'll tuck in here. The Flower Ornament Sutra, in praise of great compassion. The mind, the Buddha, and beings as well, in these three, there are no distinctions. We are all in nature pure. So let's have a look at these bodies of the Buddha. So the wisdom truth body is known as the Dharma Kaya. We know that Dharma is, is truth and is wisdom. So the Dharma Kaya is the Buddha body that includes the nature truth body and the wisdom truth body. So it's kind of got two aspects to it. It is Buddha's omniscient mind. Buddha nature meets wisdom. So that's tricky because you think that, Buddha, that Buddha's mind is omniscient. It is wisdom. But Buddha nature, which is our minds, meets wisdom. So a final wisdom consciousness, a final wisdom consciousness that perceives all modes of existence ultimate and conventional truths and all objects of knowledge. So when we finally get there, our Buddha nature meets wisdom, we will have that final wisdom consciousness. That is the Dharmakaya. Okay. Okay, so let me make sure I get this right. <laughs> now, this this one isn't known so obviously. It's like the fourth <laughs> one. Um, the Sabhavika Kaya or the Sabhavika Dharma Kaya, as it's known. And this is the Buddha body that is the emptiness of a Buddha's mind. And that Buddha's true cessations. So it's like the truth body.
but it has qualities to it that are slightly different, which is to do with the fact that it has achieved true cessation. It's a final state endowed with two purities, natural purity, the ultimate state of a Buddha's mind, Buddha nature, and then the absence of any defilements, the adventitious defilements, that are obscurations to liberation and enlightenment. So it's the Buddha's true cessation. So that's how the Buddha body is the emptiness of the Buddha's mind and the Buddha's true cessation. It's impossible for us to feel that distinction, to feel that distinction. Yeah. But intellectually, it's useful to see the subtleties, the subtleties here. Okay, so there's not usually that much teaching because it's it's too like the Dharmakaya and it's kind of complex. So let's go on to the next one, which is the complete enjoyment body, uh, the Sambhogakaya. So this is when, um, this is the known as the enjoyment body. It appears, oh, hang on, I've got a nice quotation here. Make sure I get this right, which I nicked from your library, borrowed from your library. Um, is it some bone fire? Let me just read this because it's a. Uh, the Buddha body of perfect resource or enjoyment body, the form in which the enlightened mind appears in order to benefit highly realized bodhisattvas. So we can't see it. Yeah, that's the Samboga Kaya. So it's um it's it manifests in the highest pure lands where bodhisattvas are completing their path. And I don't know where that is, <laughs> or whether it's a manifestation of mind, yeah. And um to teach Arya bodhisattvas, so bodhisattvas who have attained uh, liberation, and apparently their language is indecipherable to us. So it's something we can't make, we as samsaric beings cannot make contact with. Um, and the enjoyment body is also the rainbow body of pure light, which we looked at in that film, Tibet Trail of Light. Uh, so the, the enjoyment body is the rainbow body, which can manifest at death through specific practices, yeah? The illusory body of clear light. So it's a final form body. This is giving you the details now. Possessing the five definite characteristics, which I shall read to you. The definite abode in Akanista, the pure realm, which we've just talked about, one of the highest pure realms. It is a definite body with 32 major and 80 minor signs of a perfect being. So you could say we're looking at um, the manifestations of Buddha that we see in Manjushri and Chenrezig and Tara, these light beings with their perfect, with their, they all have the specific signs and marks of a Buddha. You know, the marks appear on the palms and soles of their feet and they have these long, it, all these are specific signs and marks of the Buddha. Yeah, we visualize them, we don't see them. Definite retinue of superior bodhisattvas. So their retinue are like beings who are following them. They're not ordinary beings. They're highly realized bodhisattvas. Definite teachings of Mahayana Dharma. So it's, you know, wisdom with, with bodhi, uh, bodhicitta. And the definite time of abiding in samsara until samsara ends without death or rebirth. So they're not going to die. They're not going to be reborn. They're not in samsara, but they serve samsara. Yeah. So when you, when you also, I believe this is right, when you um, visualize the essence of Buddhas, you know, like the Tam, Tara's Tam, the essence, that I believe is the enjoyment body. Yeah? So a, a Buddha's energy, wisdom, truth body, 
is manifesting in a way in which we will realize or become when we become the enjoyment body and then can manifest for other beings. It's not easy, is it? <laughs> so then we come to the Nimanakai, which we obviously find easier to understand. So a final form body, not having all the five characteristics and spontaneously performing the Buddha's actions of teaching, blessing, guiding, healing, and helping sentient beings. So they don't have those five characteristics of the Samboga Kaya, or definitely, 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 all the definitely's, but they manifest. So you could say that a Nirmana Kaya is His Holiness the Dalai Lama. Yeah? He's here to help sentient beings. He's also said to um, be the Inca, to be the manifestation of Thousand Dom Chinrezi, which as we're sitting in the Gompa is on the Gompa wall to my left. And um, I told the story of how Kadrola told the story of how she saw all those arms and his holiness as Chinrezi getting into a taxi. <laughs> which blows your mind as well. That's her pure vision, her pure view. So this also depends on our pure view. And I do know a, a, a few stories of people who have, you know, whoa, Manjushri appeared before me. You tend to get stories of great yogis who suddenly, you know, Chen Rezig will appear to help them. They have realized high attainments. So that's like Nimanakaya too. And then... Um, Guru Shakyamuni Buddha was seen as the supreme Nirmanakaya, the supreme emanation with all the marks and signs of a Buddha and who performs the 12 deeds, the life stages of a Buddha. And those Buddhas with different names come back in different eons to perform the same 12 deeds to show the path to enlightenment. Yeah. Uh, and then, interestingly, um, in the Nirmanakaya, the emanation body, you get what are called the artisan emanation bodies. So these can be musicians, the artists, guest actors, craftspeople, who particularly manifest to benefit others. One could say there are many amazing artists who inspire. Writers. I've told you before that I think Shakespeare was the Nimanakaya of the Buddha because his teachings uh, in, in all his writings just are incredibly Buddhist. You know, his teachings on death and impermanence and this, that, and the other are not just being English here. When you study him, it's like, wow, how did he know all this stuff? He was only a young man. Anyway, that's just my thing. We don't know. That's the thing. And it can be, they can manifest as different things for different people. So it might be a bird singing in a tree that suddenly makes you realize something. It might be a rock that you trip over as you were thinking how wonderful you are. And it's, you know, you're, you go, oh, that was pride. It can be in any way. So th there are these wonderful teachings. On see everybody, see everyone as Buddha. You know, meet Buddha on the path. That's a book, isn't it? You know, that any being, any object can manifest as Buddha to guide us and help us. So when we meet people, you, we, we are also encouraged to have pure view. So we don't only see the Guru as Buddha. But we practice seeing people, particularly those who are giving us a hard time, as Buddha, because they're changing our minds if we are open to what they're offering us. We just don't know. We just don't know who is Buddha. Hmm. So the incarnation emanation body, any incarnation, so Lama Kunchok is an emanation, is a Nimanakaya, yeah? Any incarnation or inanimate form the Buddha may take to benefit beings. Okay, 
And finally, a little bit about what's known as the Rupakaya. This is the body in which a Buddha appears to sentient beings. It includes the emanation and enjoyment bodies like deities. It's any Rupakaya is even a Buddha statue. You know, if an Arya being sees a Buddha statue, they see Buddha. You know, a dog sees a lump of metal, we see a statue. If you have pure view, if you've realized emptiness, then any form that appears to be that that is representing Buddha is Buddha. Yeah. So enough. So what I could do with at this point is questions, which I may or may not be able to answer. <laughs> but at least we can we can get have some questions about this if there's confusion or misunderstanding, and we'll try to clarify it amongst us. So I'm going to open that up. I have to say, you American people, that you're not very questioning. I've been in countries where I spend half an hour on answering really difficult questions. You've all been very kind to me. <laughs> so if you have any questions, please, and up there in the gods as well, if we have any questions, because you may have heard otherwise, you may have understood otherwise. It might not be clear, my description. Do we... I mean, the main thing, which I'm going to send you away to discuss on, to get your heads around this, is to, I think the basics of this is to understand that there is a manifestation, there is energy. And when all the contaminated aggregates have uh, died and gone, your energy as a Buddha being manifests. And its true form is actually empty. Yeah? So it's, I don't know how to explain it, but there it is. But then it can become, because it is enlightened, it, a purified, awakened consciousness, it can become anything it needs to be in order to help us. So it can manifest at this level with the highest bodhisattvas. Uh, enjoyment body suggests that there is simultaneously great bliss and wisdom. So, you know, they're not, it's not a contaminated body in any way in that manifestation. When they manifest as Nirmanakaya, what, what, uh, this is a, a, an important point, is when they manifest as Nirmanakaya, so say they are um, a Geshe or a Lama, and they get sick, then the pure view is that they are manifesting the sickness for our benefit. They're not really getting whatever it is, cancer or whatever. So to say, oh, that you know, we must pray for them. They, because they are nimanakaya and are liberated and are manifesting for our benefit, they cannot be suffering, but they can manifest it in order to teach us or as sometimes occurs, which can be, you know, difficult to handle because the students no longer have the karma with that teacher. Okay. These are the teachings I'm presenting. Okay. Nothing to do with me. <laughs> I'm not making it up. <laughs> it's not my view or my opinion. These are the teachings. So th this is what I want you to consider. So right, now I've made that point. Do we have any questions? I'm happy if you haven't, just pointing out that here I am. Oh, okay, we've got two here. We've got Bardi and we've got David. So I'm gonna go for Bardi, who is a fraction nearer and we need the microphone, please. <laughs> I'm a bit right. Mm -hmm. 
The pure consciousness won't. No, no. Yeah. Brain. <laughs> Did you repeat the question? We can't hear. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Dumb. Sorry. Thank you. Sorry. So, I, I mean, I, I guess my question is that does the Nirmanakaya uh, or does the clear consciousness of the being who has attained enlightenment and returns in the emanation body um, pick up some stains or in, act in any uh, stained ways? Um, I get it. Okay. Yeah. yeah. No, it's a good question. And it, it, is, um, it is related to the last comment I made about that if, if a llama, for instance, has an illness, then it is related to the student's karma. So they won't, they might die because the students don't have the karma. <laughs> and I do remember Lama Zopa is said, or to have said, it may even be in, in the book, Big Love, to Lama Yeshi when he was dying from his heart condition, um, he said to him, please don't die, Lama. They can change their minds. Yeah. Referring to the schism, because it was just after the schism. Okay? So we relate it to that in that our karma it will, will be we don't have the karma to have contact with some Bogakaya. Yeah? We don't have that karma. No, we, don't, we wouldn't understand it and we wouldn't see it. That is only for Arya Bodhisattvas. What we do have the karma for is to meet the flesh and blood. But that doesn't mean to say that their consciousness is affected by any physical manifestation, any physical ills, yeah? The ills will present themselves as uh, to do with the karma of the people. So they will die young or they will, it, it, for instance, young incarnations, if they're not found, there are quite a few stories whereby they just die because they're not being utilized as incarnated Nirmanakaya. So if they're not found or discovered, then they will just die young. Yeah. So that is the teaching. And it's, it's, it's a toughie because we see them as human. For instance, when Lama Zopa had his stroke, um, the way the stroke was discovered was, you know, we need to do these practices in order to purify our karma to keep the emanation of Lama Sopa here. Yeah? That is how it's presented. Now, if we're talking about a bird or a stone, in, I don't think, I don't think, but I don't know, I don't think that bird is being born from an egg and, you know, living its little life and chirruping at that moment and helping a sentient being. I think it, it will just manifest and disappear. I mean, if, if we're talking about rocks, which they do talk about, a rock or a tree or whatever, well, especially a rock, I mean, we can imagine a tree having some kind of, you know, simple consciousness of some sort, but a rock, you know, is that rock going to stay there for a thousand years? No, it's probably not. 
It's just there for a purpose. Those are the teachings. Yeah. Does that answer your question completely? Yeah? Yeah. Very hard to get your head around. It's magic. But uh, again, you know, if we are considering that enlightened mind is omniscient and has all these powers and all these qualities, it can do anything. Yeah. And we do see it on kind of crazy children's films and things like that, you know, where, where the spirits become rocks, you know, they suddenly are a rock and it, it enables somebody to pass through. If it's in our imagination, and it does exist in our imagination, then it can be realized. If we can't imagine it, it's difficult to take on board, but if we can imagine it, and it, I do remember when I first heard the teachings, I was hearing all about, you know, these different realms and duckers and dakinis, these angel-like figures. I thought, it's like, you know, we were children and we were told all these fairy stories, then we were told they weren't true, and now this llama's sitting there telling me they are true. Because it is like that, isn't it? It's like, whoa, fairies, demons, the rocks turning into this, being able to fly, all those magical aspects of being are possible when you have purified consciousness. Thank you. So let's go to David now, who had a question. Yeah, yoga. I have a deity yoga question. And oh, go on. Yeah, when you uh, generate the external deity before they become, before they come inside of us, you start out with R for the moon disk. I was wondering why you don't start out with palm for the lotus. Why we don't start off with palm? Is it, did you say palm for the lotus? Yes. Don't know. I haven't had any training. The, the lotus is there as a symbol of renunciation. Yeah. And then, then you have um, wisdom and compassion, which is the sun and the moon disk. So they are symbolic representations of the path we take in order to become the seed syllable of the deity. And the deity... Um, the seed syllable Patara is Tam, and each um, deity has their own seed, what is called as the seed syllable. Yeah? I don't know if I'm getting anywhere near answering your question. Well, the moon just sits inside the lotus, and so you start out with R, and, and I was taught that first there's the lotus, and then there's the moon disk inside the lotus. Inside, that must be a different tradition, yeah? Or, or is it? Is it the same? I, I think different traditions will treat, teach different things. When we visualize, we definitely see the lotus because they are symbolizing that that Buddha has followed that path and has purified their mind because that's what the lotus symbolizes, purify consciousness from coming out of ordinary sentientness yeah and then you have the sun and the moon cushions sometimes you just visualize deities on moon cushions they, they vary some are just on sun cushion depending on whether you are emphasizing bodhicitta or wisdom but but with um with the visualization practices they will be particularly precise to that deity so how we're visualizing Tara and the Tum is the essence of Tara that we then absorb, which mixes with our mind and then creates all that energy of the 21 Taras. I don't know if that helps, but that's what I understand. Um, yeah, it helps. I never heard of a sun disk, but yeah, it helps. Is that okay? I don't feel like I've answered your question, but perhaps it's because I don't know the answer to your particular 
query. Um, yeah, thank you. Okay. <laughs> Simpler to say. As you said, you. in the Sadhana of uh, Lama Zilpa Rinpoche, he's the one who taught me that, that Sadhana, and he started out with the lotus disc. I mean, the lotus. Yeah. Well, that's Lama Zilpa. Then, then it's right, isn't it? But, you know, different sadhanas at different times, even Lama Zopa, he will emphasize different things. So I think for you, David, just go with the sadhana, what it's suggesting that you visualize. Yeah? But in, in the Tara sadhana, in, as far as my memory goes, we don't visualize the lotus. Thank you. Okay, thank you, thank you. Tricky one. Okay. Um, any other questions? Okay, well, this has clearly blown your mind. It is interesting, fascinating. I want you to have a good discussion on this. So it's 10 past three. So we'll go to, do you want a break? Listen to me, do you want a break? Would you like a, a short five minute break? Yes. See, I'm kind. <laughs> I'm going, come on, let's get on. <laughs> have a five minute break till quarter past three, then have 20 minutes discussion. But make your five minute break a five minute break. Yeah, because you need a good 20 minutes. So, what are you discussing? You don't know what you're discussing yet. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's fairly obvious. Is there? Uh, do you get this? Is there anything about this? Let's talk specifically about because I know this is tricky for for uh, students to understand the the issues arising from the Nimanakaya, how we might make mistakes, how you know is it true? You know, really get your head a around that. But for sure you can discuss if there's any questions about the others, okay? So, um, yeah, thank you very much. I'll see you all at 25 to four. Okay, so let's formally go to our little groups now. Um, did you have two groups up there in the sky? Yeah, okay. And did we have one or two groups? One group, okay. All right, then that, that's great. So let's start with um, my Zoom people here. So Jayla, can you uh, identify one group and or somebody um, be a spokesperson for what was the main, the main topic of conversation or any queries that came up? Who are we getting? I'll, I'll speak for our group. Um, basically it was everybody telling me what was going on because I was lost. Um, but we did have some, um, interesting conversations. <laughs> uh, David or uh, Kathleen, did you guys want to add anything or Phyllis? Well, I was confused about, um, any form other than Nirmanakaya. It just seemed as if we wouldn't mm -hmm. even know. All we know is Namanakaya and Samboga Kaya isn't visible to us. Dhammakaya, I don't think that's visible to us as unenlightened beings. So yes. it's we don't we and you said the, the Dalai Lama is showing us Namanakaya, but he's probably Samboga Kaya. But we only know what we are allowed to see, which is Namanakaya. Yeah, and remember also that, you know, the bodies of a Buddha, if they can manifest as Nirmanakaya, they can manifest as Sambhogakaya and Dharmakaya. You know, it, it, there's, it's not sort of levels of emanation. They are all the same because they are enlightened beings. 
for all we can relate to, as you say, as you rightly say, and which perhaps we should focus on, is the Namanakaya. So in terms of taking this back to this topic of refuge, Buddha, Dharma and Sangha, we are looking to bring it all together. We're looking at the guru as a manifestation, as a Nimanakaya of Buddha. Yeah. That, that's really simplifying it for anybody who's feeling like, wow, I'm not really getting this or it's too far. You know about it, but what you, all you need to be aware of is this is how we see our gurus, our true gurus as Nimanakaya. So, for instance, when we were watching that film, some of us, last night, or when you will be able to watch The Unmistaken Child, you have a clear, a very clear process of what happens in um, Tibetan, the Tibetan monastic world when a high lama who is realized passes, they then look for his reincarnation. So they are definitely emanations because they are controlling their consciousness at the time of death into a body which will be of service to sentient beings yeah uh, now now one one thing you could say and it's a query to me is that child which you, some of you haven't seen i know but the child definitely appeared to be upset when the mother and father were leaving yeah so so then we go now some of us will go well that's a manifestation for human beings and others of us will go, well, when you take rebirth into a physical body, and this comes back to um, my friend Bade's question, when you take rebirth, you are subject, this, this is a view, you are subject to some of the emotions and contamination of that body you take on, yeah? That's one, that's one view, because one of the explanations of going on the Bodhisattva path, which is extensive, you know, there are 10 bhumis, I believe, levels, so in, and, and some bhogakaya can appear to you, so it's incredibly pure-minded. But if you are committing to taking rebirth, for the benefit of sentient beings, you are having some kind of residual karmic experience because you're in a physical body. Yeah? So you, you're actually continuing to be in samsara, but out of samsara. Yeah? So Nimanakaya is... Um, we have to take it in a way that works for us because there are different views and because it is so difficult. But that, that's, that's, that's the way we connect Buddha through to the teachers that we meet. And that is what was being represented in that film. And what is great it's that Geshe Zopa is going to be here and you can ask him. <laughs> and he would definitely know better than me, okay? Because he's part of that. He understands that perfectly. And he will give you that view. He will give you, you know, the view, the view, yeah? What I'm doing is I'm going, yeah, well, you know, you're meant to have this view, but some of us think this because you know we're we're not in that situ we're not in that setup. We're not in that pure kind of Tibetan Buddhist setup. We're mucky. Mucky in samsara really with with difficulties with our faith. Definitely. Yeah. So each of you can go at it with your own view that's comfortable. And as I always say to everybody who's struggling with certain aspects of Buddhism that they never expected to have to take on. 
<laughs> you know, they went into it for stabilizing the mind or peace and contentment or because rebirth and come. They never expected to get all these kind of layered teachings of, of manifestations, etc., etc., to just put it to one side and think, okay, that's fine. I'm doing this. That one, I respect because I'm ignorant. I'm not going to challenge it because greater beings have taught this. Yeah? And just leave it. Well, at some point, well, when it's necessary, you can come back to it. You know, one thing that came up, uh, you were talking about people emanating in the Mauna Kea form, as far as the artisan was concerned. Mm. So if they do that, I was thinking about Coltrane and Bach, would they have been Dhammakaya or Sambhogakaya? Not it's all the same. Okay, we don't want to separate them. They're all the same thing, yeah? So if you've got an Imanakaya, it is a Dharmakaya. Who can be a Sambhogakaya? Who can be an Imanakaya? It's enlightened energy, which is manifesting in different ways, yeah? But you will experience them as Nimanakaya. That's our way of understanding their energy. Yeah? Does that make sense? Yeah. It's just, it's the same thing. You know, when, when you do certain practices, you dissolve into the Dharmakaya, and then you take rebirth um, as the Sambhogakaya, and Sambhogakaya takes rebirth as Nimanakaya. You know, in certain tantric practices, that's what you do. You're all the same thing. You're just manifesting yourself in different ways for different purposes. So, yeah, Bach and Coltrane sounds good to me. Definitely. Let's move on. I'm conscious of time. Um, do, do we have any other... Did you guys come up with it? Yes. Is there any, any other questions or statements? I'm losing track now. Or have you been represented in the Gompa? You've been represented. Do we have one more group up there, I think, who hasn't been represented or said their bit? Do we, Shayla? For our group, yes. But the other group with um, Aaron and Charlene and Barbara. Barbara, why don't you speak for us? You're a good speaker. Charlene. Oh, no, you don't want to speak. Who wants to speak? Shayla? No, Barbara. Barbara needs to speak. Oh, for Barbara, us. there you are down there. <laughs> Quietly trying to get out of it. Okay, Barbara, <laughs> let's hear from you. <laughs> wow, we, we had a lot to talk about. Um, for me personally, this has always been unbelievably confusing. And today is the first time that I really think I got a little bit. It's oh. making sense to me. So Some sense is good. So for me personally, thank you. It has really, really been a difficult concept for me. It is. It is a difficult concept. It is. I guess I guess it's quite an advanced refuge course, this, because I don't think you get it in the Discovering Buddhism module. But uh, my, my assessment is, is that the majority of you are actually quite experienced Buddhists. And... Oh, look at you but you're you've taken refuge you've been practicing and therefore you know the main topics of refuge we did yesterday guru devotion is vital to understand and get a grip on i think when you're taking refuge in the tibetan buddhist tradition and the bodies of the buddha kind of connect you know our ideas about how we see the guru because it's very much connected with our understanding of Nirmanakaya, yeah? That they can be Buddha. They can be manifesting as Buddha. Okay. Well, I thank you, and I'm going to um, knock that discussion on the head now, because I would seriously like to finish with a short visualization meditation, bringing our refuge practice all together, and then some dedication prayers and if you are sitting there as an interested observer, 
Um, nobody is forcing you to say the prayers, but I think you'll enjoy the visualization of uh, the Buddha, yeah? As we call him, Guru Shakyamuni Buddha, yeah? The teacher, the spiritual guide who manifested for us. And that's the Mahayana view, that he wasn't a normal human being. He manifested for us. He chose to come and perform the 12 deeds for our benefit. So there you go. Very different view to the Theravada view. What am I looking for? Oh, I know. Okay. I'm not sure I get all this right. And I'm going to bring down the prayers as well. She says, hopefully. So what I have to do and I've got two sets of prayers. So I've got the, the regular dedication prayers, which will say at the end of the visualization. But I've also got the Shantideva dedication, which is so lovely, which I thought would be nice at the end of my visit, you know. So you'll have to be patient with me while I bring that down as well. So let's see what we can do. It says host only can share. Can you make me a co-host, please, somebody? Who makes me a co-host? Do you, Shayla? Sorry. You should you already on. be a... It, says, it already just says, a, I can't share. It says host only. How interesting. <laughs> yes, it is very interesting. <laughs> we need it there. With technology. <laughs> Just make me host instead, Venerable Dondrup says. Okay. Right. Brilliant. There you okay. go. So we don't, we want... No, well now I've lost the ordinary dedication anyway. Oh well, we'll do just we'll we'll do Shanti Davis dedication. I think when I did that magical thing at the beginning and got rid of it, I got rid of it. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear! So I'm going to put this this up, and then we'll do that. It's very lovely anyway. Okay. Okay, guys, so let's just do a few minutes of this lovely visualization where we bring together the course on uh, refuge and consider the elements of it and make it real in our minds. So it's a nice deep breath and relax. And we're going to visualize as fully as we can the objects of refuge. So we're starting with the visualization of Guru Shakyamuni Buddha. And if you, to the best of your ability, gently and comfortably, and viewing this as entirely made of light, start to build up the image of the Buddha. We can start with a wonderful throne, completely encrusted with precious jewels. And it's in the sky, level with our forehead, about two meters ahead of us, six feet or so, slightly larger than life. And this glorious throne at each corner are two mystical, magical snow lions holding up the throne. And on the seat of the throne is a full-blown lotus, beautiful variegated petals, filling 
the seat of the throne that will take the Buddha. And on that is a sun disk with a moon disk on top. We talk about disk. We are representing wisdom and bodhicitta and renunciation with the with the lotus. So out of that has come this incredible consciousness. Entirely made of light, golden and white. And then seated upon that glorious moon cushion is the Buddha. His golden in color. He was seated in the Vajra posture. He's wearing saffron robes of a monk, which do not touch his body, you know, an inch or so away, but enveloping and robing without touching. And there's all the marks and signs of the Buddha. We particularly notice his blue black hair coiled on top of his head with the Ushnisha at the crown of his coiled hair. His, co his hair coils individually to the right. And the long lobes with jeweled ornaments. And his hands rest in meditation mudra. In his lap with thumbs touching, arms upturned. His eyes are so kind, full of love, long slanted, gazing at you with absolute love and compassion. Slips are red. Just let him sit there and glow and all that golden light is falling all around on you and on all sentient beings surrounding you. If you can do that, do that. Mother, father, sister, brother, all the females to your left, all the males to your right, people behind you, beyond you, all eight billion of us, and then all the other sentient beings. Just fill the space. Just imagine. And there we are. And all that light falls on you as he gazes at you. And then behind him, vast and high, are rows and rows of glorious texts shining, wrapped in silks and brocades, as beautiful as you can make them. The precious Dharma. All from this source, the Buddha. And then surrounding him in the sky, all the bodhisattvas, including any of the deities that you know of and love, like Tara, Green Tara, Thousand Armed Avalokiteshvara, Manjushri, And then around, filling the space, the precious Sangha, the unimaginably kind teachers. All 
all of them that you have received teachings from. Refuge Lamas, Lama Sopa Rinpoche, Lama Yeshi as the head, the spiritual directors of this foundation, which has brought you so much. His Holiness the Dalai Lama, please pack the space with Arya beings, those you believe to have attained liberation. The view of emptiness. And there's your Buddha Dharma Sangha. And then make incredible offerings at the front. Traditional offerings like the water bowls. Fill the space with flowers and incense and light. Food, music, perfume. Offer it. in immense gratitude and in return to be blessed. And as we feel the blessings of Guru Shakyamuni and all the Sangha, and the blessings of the Dharma come towards us in the form of Golden light, pure, untainted. We can say Shanti Deva's beautiful dedication prayer, along with all the sentient beings in the space around us, all the people who have attended on Zoom, and all the people in the Gompa. Just let us all be there saying this from our hearts. May all beings everywhere, plagued by sufferings of body and mind, obtain an ocean of happiness and joy by virtue of my merits. May no living creature suffer, commit wrong, or ever feel ill. May no one be afraid or belittled with a mind weighed down by depression. May the blind see forms and the deaf hear sounds. May those whose bodies are worn with toil be restored on finding repose. May the naked find clothing, the hungry find food, may the thirsty find water and delicious drinks. May the poor find wealth, those weak from sorrow find joy. May the forlorn find hope, constant happiness and prosperity. May there be timely rains and bountiful harvests May all medicines be effective and wholesome prayers bear fruit. May all who are sick and ill quickly be freed from their ailments. Whatever diseases there are in the world, may they never occur again. May the frightened cease to be afraid. And be free. May powers find power and may think of benefiting each other. For as long as space remains, for as long as sentient beings remain, until then may I too remain to dispel the miseries of the world. Thank you so much. Thank you for a lovely weekend. <clears throat> oh, it's a good time to start losing my voice, isn't it? I've finished. Thank you for a lovely weekend and thank you for your kindness towards me. And I've really enjoyed the teach sharing the teachings with you. All of you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I just wanted to, to say on behalf of the center, um, Andy traveled thousands of miles to spend the month with us. So we're really grateful. Um, so thank you very much.
You're very welcome. Thank you, Thank you for inviting me, Venerable Dondra. Thank you. <laughs>